Okay, thank you very much. Well, I'd like to start by uh, thanking the organizers for inviting me. It's my second time now at the ICTP, and uh, it's been really wonderful. It's every bit as good, if not better, than the, the first time I was here, especially because this time I have a sea view. Last time I was looking at the car park, so it's a big improvement. So today I'd like to tell you about knots and liquid crystals. This is all joint work with Tom Machon, who's up at the back there. Um, and it's uh, motivated in large part by uh, Slobodan Zumer's experiments at Ljubljana, the stuff that he's been doing with his group and Igor Mushevich's group that uh, created knots in liquid crystals for the first time about five years ago now, maybe six for actually doing it. Um, and the question that I want to talk about is what on earth does it mean to have a knot in a pneumatic liquid crystal? What is it like? What are its properties? So I'll start by saying a few words about liquid crystals. And um, I'll repeat something that Randy said yesterday. One of the ways of explaining to you all what liquid crystals are is to show something like this and say, if you're old enough to remember this transition, then you have no excuse for not knowing what a liquid crystal is. But maybe I'll say some things that are a little more scientific also. So if you look at them under a microscope, this is one of my favorite ways of explaining to people what liquid crystals are. Um, apparently, this is what liquid crystals are. Um, and it's remarkable. Uh, Randy talked about how you could extract uh, molecular size information from this picture. It's also the case that uh, back in 1910, George Friedel was able to understand with molecular resolution what's going on in this material just by looking at this picture. So I invite you all to think about how he might have done that. Apparently, it was something that he learned in high school. So I think that's another excellent way um, to convey what liquid crystals are. But if you look in a textbook, you see something different. So here's a sort of standard textbook in the field, and it will tell you that liquid crystals are composed of long rod-like molecules, and then those molecules can do a bunch of things. Either they can be disordered, that's an isotropic phase, or they can all point in the same direction, and that's the stuff that's in your displays, or they can have these uh, states with higher degrees of order in it, like these smectic states that Randy talked about. There's one other um, aspect that I like to emphasize. Instead of talking about the way in which they're ordered, maybe I'll go back a slide. Um, you can compare also this picture with the previous one and ask yourself how closely do the textbooks reproduce what you actually see in the real world. And one of the features of the sort of simple textbook descriptions is that everything is really perfect. The layers are flat, the molecules all point in exactly the same direction. And so another characteristic feature of these materials and many others is to try to capture the essence of the defects in them where the order breaks down in some way. And so pictures like this are extremely instructive for conveying what liquid crystals are. You see, locally you have an alignment of filaments. And then there are these points, there's a couple of them I've highlighted, there are a couple more that I haven't, where you can't assign any actual orientation to the molecules at those points. And more than that, you can characterize their character by thinking about how the orientation winds around them. Okay, so these are called disclinations. And the main feature that this shows is that the rotation of the molecules around one of these points is not an integer multiple of 2 pi, but a half integer multiple of 2 pi. And so it's telling you visually, directly, without any other input, that this is not a vector-ordered material. This is a line field that you're looking at. OK, well, I'll say a few more, two more slides um, with sort of general introduction to the theory of liquid crystals, how to think about them. And I wanted to say this because um, this way of, of presenting things has increasingly had a more a more profound influence on my own work. Uh, it's remarkable, this is a paper of Charles Franks from 1958, where he really set in stone the elasticity theory for liquid crystals. It's one of the most famous contributions in the entire subject. 
and it also happens to be the only paper that he published on liquid crystals. So he did two completely seminal things in just one paper. Uh, one of them was that he described the elasticity, and the feature here, the thing, the contribution that he brought to it, was not to do it in some kind of algebraic fashion, but to think about it from geometric purposes. So I want to describe the distortions of a perfectly aligned state in some geometric way. I'll give you a little flavor of just one of these. If I look at this bend distortion, I can describe this as a curvature by saying, well, if I imagine the integral curves of the line field, so that's some curve in space, it will have some curvature, and that curvature is exactly the bend distortion of the line field. Okay, so that's one way of thinking about the fundamental distortions that go on. The other ones correspond to a mean curvature of layers that the line field is the normal to, or a mean torsion, a way in which things are twisting. And the insight that he brought to this was that these ones were somehow already known about from Osane, but by thinking about it in terms of curvatures, he was able to realize that there's another curvature that he knows about, which isn't on the list, and which you can add to the elasticity theory. So of course, there's also some analog of a Gaussian curvature for the line field. And uh, by thinking about it in the right way, he could really get the right elasticity theory for liquid crystals. So another feature of liquid crystals that I like a lot is that they're really very highly geometrical, and thinking about them in geometrical terms is really useful. Yes, so if you, if you take a curve whose tangent is everywhere in the line field, then it will have some curvature, and it's exactly this quantity. Actually, um, as an aside, uh, a random aside just about vector calculus, everybody in the field writes this bend distortion as n cross curl n. And I find that obscures this geometrical interpretation. Whereas if I say that it's the gradient of the line field as I move in the direction of the line field, it's much more obvious. The other contribution that he made was a classification of the defects in the material. Uh, he was thinking about a sort of simple situation where I have a two-dimensional material and there are isolated singular points where the orientation is not defined. And this is uh, figure two from his paper where he drew all these examples and illustrated all the different things that can happen. It's a line field, so it comes back to an equivalent state in rotations that are half integer multiples of 2 pi rather than integer multiples of 2 pi. But other than that, it can rotate by any of those half integers whatsoever. And those all correspond to different types of point defects in a two-dimensional or quasi-two-dimensional pneumatic material. And there's a slightly sort of fancier way of wrapping this up in terms of homotopy groups that Randy talked a little bit about yesterday. And one of the things that they're good for is that they tell you what the analogous classification, the analogous to what Frank did, is in three dimensions. If I take line defects and I try to classify them with the same homotopy tool, then uh, the homotopy classification is just Z mod 2. There are exactly two of them. There's a line that is no defect at all, and there's a line that is a defect. And then it's interesting to look at this picture of the cross-sectional profiles and, for instance, convince yourself that there is a continuous deformation of something that looks locally like this picture into one that looks locally like the minus one-half winding. And if you haven't done that for yourselves, then that's another nice geometrical exercise that I encourage. So this is a still from a video that I got from Miha Raunik at Ljubljana um, of some of the experiments that were done there associated with work that he did. Uh, this is a quench experiment. You take two colloidal particles, you put them in a liquid crystal, you locally melt the material around it with a laser beam, then you turn the laser beam off, it forms a collection of defects, and they settle down into some nice configuration around the defect. And I pulled out a still before it settles to the final state to emphasize that these really are nice elongated lines and they have interesting shapes. 
And what I'll try to do today is to give uh, some kind of generic classification of the properties of such lines in pneumatic materials from a sort of a global perspective of trying to characterize what they're like and especially what they're like when they're not simple loops but have knots in them. So uh, this is just a sort of uh, summary slide to try to convey to you very briefly that uh, since the experiment came out of the Ljubljana group about five years ago, there's been a, a number of people around the world trying to make similar sorts of things in liquid crystals. So there's quite some variety of sort of knotted structures that uh, you can study these days. And there's quite um, a significant amount of experimental work that is available where you can really genuinely make these things um, in the lab in some kind of controllable or reliable way by a number of different techniques. And so we want to contribute some kind of theoretical understanding to the sorts of things that they're doing in these experiments. And that's going to be one of the goals for this talk. <clears throat> now, I want to give some kind of contrast. One of the things that's wonderful about coming to seminars or uh, workshops like this is the great diversity that there is in the talks. You get to hear all sorts of things that are not in your own subject area, and that's something that I like a lot. So everything, of course, is about knots, but there are many different types of knots. So here are just a small selection of things. I thought, um, it hasn't really come out. I made it too faded in the background. But in principle, uh, the background is this knot table from uh, Tate's paper that uh, a couple of other people have shown. And I thought I would uh, supplement that with another sort of artistic rendition of knots. So here are some beautiful ones from the Book of Kells, which is one of the ancient books in Ireland uh, at Trinity College, Dublin. Uh, and then there are a couple of flavors. So that we've heard about knots in the first day about knots in molecules, in molecular structures, molecular ordering. There are knots in DNA. And then there are also these knots in continuous fields, like these vortex knots that Renzo was talking about, and knots in optical systems that you might think of as being slightly different because they're not just knots in a little strand. They're knots in a continuous material, and you have to worry about the entire field that's around them specifying some quantum wave function or something like this. How are you supposed to do that? What does that mean? And so it's interesting, even though you might always be producing the trefoil knot, for instance, every time you see it, it has a slightly different character and a slightly different flavor to it, and you learn something new about it. And I thought I would show a little microcosm of this, um, again, as a sort of general motivation for trying to understand what knots are like in different physical systems. This is a recent one that I heard about when I visited Durham at the start of the year and talked with Paul Sutcliffe. Um, so these are two systems that, loosely speaking, are vortex knots. They're slightly different. One of them is the gross pitayevsky equation that Renzo was talking about. So that's like a Bose condensate or a superfluid vortex knot. The other one is a vortex knot in a reaction diffusion system. It's the fitzhu nagumo equation. So it's slightly different systems, but as a loose sense, they're both vortex knots. And the question is, do they behave the same or do they behave differently? So William Irvine's paper was exactly about um, the sorts of things that Renzo was talking about, that under evolution you have these reconnection events, there are pathways, the knot type changes. He starts with a complicated 917 knot. It goes through some sequence. And at the end of the day, you end up with an unknot or some collection of unknots. So that's one way in which knots can behave in continuous fields. And I think Paul Sutcliffe finds something very interesting. Here's uh, his simulation with uh, the Fitzhugh Nogumo equation. So it simplifies and simplifies and simplifies, and you end up with the unknot. So you start with something that looks complicated in both cases, and in both cases, it simplifies, and you end up with the unknot. What's different about it is that this started out as the unknot. There were no reconnections. There were no crossing events. It was nothing like this. And 
Uh, I show the movie for the unknot, but this was true for actual knots, for trefoil knots and higher type knots that they studied in this system. So I think it's very interesting that although in principle they're both types of vortex knots, they behave very differently um, because of the physical system. And I think it's a problem. Well, I asked him if he had any understanding of this, and at the time he didn't really. Uh, and I think it's a wonderful question. So I'm going to talk about knots and pneumatics with in mind a feeling for what does the pneumatic tell me about the knot? Why is it, what is special about it being in a liquid crystal as opposed to being a superfluid knot? And the two questions that I'm going to focus on are a classification question. I'd like to know what are all of the knots in liquid crystals. I would like to come up with an analog of Tate's table, some tabulation of knots. I want to know how many different knots there are, or how many different pneumatic textures there are for each given knot type. So what is the homotopy classification? And the second question, which I'll start with, is a simple one. I've shown you already that you can make these experimentally. Experimentally, you can make knots in pneumatic materials. Well, I wonder, can I do that as a theorist? I don't have a lab, but I can think very hard. Can I do it for myself? So it turns out that the doing it for yourself is not so difficult. There's a small trick, but it's only a small one. What you need to do is get yourself a copy of this beautiful book by John Milner and read the first three pages. So it's not all that hard. And he explains in those first three pages the following construction for torus knots, arbitrary torus knots. You take a complex polynomial in two complex variables with integers p and q that are telling me the type of uh, torus knot or link that I'm encoding. And then if you look at the following thing, if you look at where this polynomial is zero, so where it vanishes on the surface of a three sphere. So I have two complex numbers. That's four real numbers. I take the sum of the squares to be one. That's a three sphere. So on a three-sphere, I ask, where is this number identically zero? And then it's a wonderful exercise to think about that and figure out that it's exactly a PQ torus knot. Now, we want more than this. We don't just want the curve. I want to specify the orientation of a liquid crystal molecule at every single point in space, not just on this curve. But Milnor also tells me how to do that. He tells me, hey, look, away from this curve, I have this complex number that isn't zero. And if it's a complex number that isn't zero, it has a phase. And the phase is an angle. And you can point your liquid crystal molecule at whatever that angle happens to be. So there's a prescription for filling up all of space except for this torus knot curve with some angle, which is the direction that you orient your liquid crystal molecules at. So that's nice. It's a fairly straightforward thing. We used this uh, to good effect for some of our early work. Um, it's also a little restricted. Um, he's able to construct torus knots, and they're useful for many things, and they come up frequently in many applications, but it, they're certainly not all possible knots. So you might like to do other things. And you can extend the technique a little bit and do some other knots. Um, and it, you can go quite some way in constructing things that are geometric braids. But there again, you're a little constrained that the shape of the thing is a geometric braid and not an arbitrary curve. And so I'll remind you of these images from the simulations that um, William Irvine and Paul Sutcliffe were doing. Um, these are numerical simulations, but they still have to start them in the right state. Otherwise, you know. You have no hope of creating this spontaneously. And so they managed to solve this problem of constructing completely arbitrary knots. You just take a random curve and generate some field from it. And I'd like to tell you about that because I think it's a nice story. Um, and also, it's one that, at least in principle, we should all be familiar with. So the idea is to use the Bios of our law, basically. Turn it into either a magnetostatics problem, or I'll talk about it in the language of fluid dynamics and vortex lines, um, because, well, I find that slightly more convenient for my purposes. So 
What you do is you pick an arbitrary curve, you imagine it to be a vortex line in exactly the way that Renzo described in the previous um, talk, and then you can construct from that vortex line what the fluid flow field is absolutely everywhere in the material by some kind of Biot-Savar law. So if it was a current loop, this really would be exactly the magnetic field that you would measure. So that tells you uh, about some vector field that's circulating around this line. And then you ask yourself if you can turn that vector field into a, an angle that is winding around the line. And that angle, of course, is the velocity potential or the magnetostatic potential associated with those fields. And so there's a fairly generic prescription that says start with any curve that you care to dream of and end up with some angle that tells you how to orient your, uh, your field, your, your liquid crystal, or your superfluid, or whatever it is that you happen to be working with. Okay, and I'll show this just again to emphasize that in these continuous systems, you really have to specify what's going on throughout all of space, what the field is like absolutely everywhere, and not just on some curve. And of course, this is exactly what this construction does. Okay, these things are kind of awkward to think about and visualize, so sometimes it's nice to see a sort of hands-on description. Okay, and we can, of course, you can um, take this and just plug it in immediately to construct some director field that winds around the curves and turns them into defect lines in the liquid crystal, and you can construct a whole bunch of textures in this way. There's only one little drawback from this construction um, in terms of its generality when it comes to uh, applications in liquid crystals as opposed to in superfluids, for instance. And that is that the director field that I write down, the way that I write it down, it has components in the x direction and in the z direction, but not in the y direction. So these are all completely planar textures. The liquid crystal molecules live in this plane and they don't point towards you or away from you at all. And, okay, you can do that, but the molecules are allowed to do whatever they want. So we should also be able to describe states where they can rotate more freely. If you like, we need a second angle that will tell you the angle that they are towards you or away from you, in addition to this angle in the xz plane. And so, uh, I'd like to think for a moment or two about how to do that. And uh, in doing it, I find it convenient to translate the original sort of Bios of art construction into one in terms of differential forms. But the key part is that when you're trying to construct this angle that's winding, any angle that's winding around some zero, um, it winds by two pi, and you have to decide whether you want it to be between zero and two pi, and then there's a cut at two pi and you start again, or whether you want it to be minus pi to plus pi, and there's a cut between minus pi and plus pi, or whatever it happens to be, you have to decide to cut things on some cut surface in order to define a, an angle in some kind of uniquely uh, single-valued fashion. So the key trick in this is to introduce a surface whose boundary is the knot. And of course, there's tremendous freedom in the choice of exactly what that surface is. And if you make different choices, you might get different knots. So an example of that, here's the simplest example of that. Here's the hop flink. I show you the hop flink with two surfaces. They look fairly similar, but if you stare at them for long enough, you can see that they're different, and they really genuinely are different from each other. One is linking number plus one, the other one is linking number minus one. And that's going to be a, a topological invariant that will be preserved so long as you always have a hop flink. So it really matters whether you pick this surface or that surface, you get something different. The other thing is that the surface helps us out in trying to choose or construct a second angle that will bring the orientation of the molecules out of this xz plane to pointing towards you in some way. And that's because it provides us with some additional structure to the space. The space that is not this surface 
is an interesting space. It has all these holes in it that you can go through and come back up some other hole and so on. So here, are, uh, it turns out there are, there are two cycles. The homology of the complement has dimension two. So I show a uh, choice of bases for them here. And what you can do is you can pick another curve. So a second curve, again, completely arbitrary curve. It could be a knot if you like. And it should correspond, whatever it is, it will live in the complement of this surface and it will correspond to some homology class. And again, the homology class will be a topological property of the thing that you're constructing. So it matters which class you choose. Other than that, it doesn't matter so much. Having done that, you can then construct an angle that winds around it by exactly the same trick as I described previously. So that now gives us two angles. And if I have two angles, that covers all directions on the sphere. I ought to be able to get the molecule to point in any direction I want. So that's the idea. You use those two angles. You write down a slightly more general uh, expression for what the direction of the liquid crystal is pointing in. And then I encode this second angle that I introduced by some kind of color winding. Here's the schematic that tells you this color winding that's going from in this plane to pointing out towards you. And you can construct a whole bunch of different things in this way. But still, there are questions about these things. There are at least two serious questions about this. We can construct lots of things. But you should still ask yourself, can we construct everything? Is this really completely general? And um, are these all different from each other? Or are some of these secretly equivalent under some appropriate homotopy of the texture? So it's nice to have uh, a robust, I mean, in principle, this construction would give you a robust answer to that. Um, but in practice, our knowledge of cobordisms of surfaces was not quite strong enough to carry it out in this way. So we had a slightly different approach to coming up with a, a knot table, if you like, for textures in pneumatic liquid crystals. The approach is essentially a traditional calculation in algebraic topology using the methods of obstruction theory that I won't tell you about. I'll just tell you what the answer is. So the answer is that the number of different pneumatic textures that you can construct with some particular fixed knot as the defect set is in one-to-one -one correspondence with the elements of some group. This group is the first homology of the branch double cover of the link complement. And then there's some equivalence relation that's associated with the fact that I have a line field rather than a vector field. So up is the same as down. Um, so the, really the point about this is that having identified it, this, this thing, this is a not invariant, and you can look that up in all sorts of tables and tabulations, and it's not so difficult to calculate it for yourself by a variety of different little techniques. And so when you've done this, you can write down that if I have a 4-4 torus link, there are this infinite number of different things that I can do in a pneumatic liquid crystal, there's not just one of them. And if I have this collection of three things, a trefoil knot, an on knot, and a hop flink, and they're all together in the same material, then there's this number of different pneumatic textures that I can make. And if you make the Borromean rings, then there's only 16 of them. Suddenly there's a finite number. And they come with some structure associated to that 16 of them. To give you a flavor, of the sort of variety that's out there and some of the things that we uh, find out about the properties of knots when they're in liquid crystals as opposed to other materials. Here's a sample of the torus knots. So these are the PQ torus knots for P and Q up to 12. And I write the, what this group, what this magic number is that uh, encodes the number of distinct pneumatic textures that there are. And there are a few things that come out. So one of the things that comes out is that some of them are completely unique. There's just one single knot. So all of this stuff that I told you about, whether it was planar or it had these funny windings and so on and so forth, those were all equivalent to each other. You could do that. 
But as far as the topology is concerned, those were all equivalent. In other cases, there is something funny that happens that I'll try to say a couple of words about in a few slides time, which is that the group that appears is just a bunch of different co a bunch of copies of Z mod 2. And it turns out that the twos are important for some other property that pneumatics have. So I'll come back to this in a moment. But these, these things where everything is just a copy of two, so there are eight copies of Z mod 2 for a 99 torus link, turns out to be an interesting observation from this table. And the last thing is that some of times there are an infinite number of distinct textures that you can construct. Um, and I guess, in a sense, we were kind of surprised about I guess we would have been surprised either way if, if um, you know, they had all been infinite and only a few finite, we would have been surprised. And the other way around, we would also have been surprised. So we scratched our heads for a long time, wondering what was going on that gave us these infinite numbers. And then it was wonderful. Um, I don't always think about liquid crystals. Sometimes I do experiments with soap films. I persuade my students to take time off from serious stuff and uh, do homemade experiments with soap films. So I'm going to show you an experiment that conveys or explains why there are an infinite number of states in these systems. So this is a, an experiment that was done by Tom and Davide and uh, another one of my students that's not here, Dario uh, Papavasilou, a couple of years ago, with a rig that they 3D printed with the 3D printer that Matthew provided. Thank you, Matthew. Um, and set up this little experiment with a 4-4 torus link in soap. And then you try, you create a surface on it. So you create a spanning film. Then you have to pop some holes until it's a proper surface. So that's what we do first. Okay, so now we have a surface whose boundary is the link. And then you move the rings around and the surface changes. And every now and then, its topology changes. It is a real-time movie, so it's quite fast in real time. And then suddenly, this happens. Okay. So what's happened here, it's maybe a little difficult to see it on this screen. But if I tell you, you might be able to pick it out. What's happened here is that I now have not one surface, but two. There is a surface here that connects these two components. And that forms a hot flink with a nice little hot flink surface. And then there's a completely separate surface here that connects these two components, but is otherwise identical. And so this is the magic fact that if you can construct a surface whose boundary is the link and it has more than one component, then its Alexander polynomial is trivial. And you can compute this group, and the order is infinite. So that's where the infinity comes from. And it was really nice to see it in a homemade experiment. Okay, so here's uh, some clearer pictures of the different surfaces, the transitions that you saw in that video. We started with this surface. Then it went to this one uh, about halfway through. And the end state was this one on the right. This, this one is with surface evolver. OK, well, um, I gave a classification of what all the different types of knots are. So it would be nice to apply it, where possible, to some experimental data. The experimentalists can make these things. It would be nice to say which one they made. Of course, identifying knots is difficult, and identifying them in pneumatics is no less so. But if it's simple enough, then we know some things, and we can uh, make some progress. So one of the things that's simple enough, this is a beautiful experiment of liquid crystals that are embedded into toroidal droplets. It was done by Ivan Schmaluk's group at Boulder. And you have normal anchoring conditions on the surface of the droplets, and they form defect lines in the interior because of those anchoring boundary conditions. And they can make a variety of essentially torus knots with this construction, you have them in a torus geometry with the defect lines winding around. And then it's a question of how many times they wrap over themselves. 
as to which torus knot or link you end up with, so they can construct trefoil knots and sometimes hop links. And I'll tell you about the analysis of the hop link. So, of course, first of all, I should tell you a little bit about how to think about hop links and uh, identify how many of them there are and how we'll try to identify them. So it turns out that there are just two of them, and there are two ways in which you can think about them and think about the differences. One is in terms of these planar configurations that I started telling you about, the things that just depend on one angle and have no component that's pointing towards you. And I told you there, I showed you an example, that there were two surfaces that you could choose. One gives linking number plus one, the other one gives linking number minus one. And it turns out that that's a way of describing the two different states that exist in the system. And usually, I think about it in those terms. So I'll map everything onto one of these planar configurations and refer to the two different textures as being either linking number plus one or linking number minus one. That's one way of assigning them. Another way of doing it would be to use this second angle that I introduced and have some winding around a zero line that links with this hot flink. Okay. And I represent that angle winding, that angle variation by some color that's going around a color wheel on the surface itself. Okay, so that's telling you what this angle is. Just map it onto color on a color wheel. And so you should ask yourself, um, how can I relate one of these colored descriptions to one of the planar ones? And there's a process that, uh, of deformation that says, well, you can make the rotation very rapid. You can collapse it into a small region of space and have it more or less constant everywhere else. That's a continuous deformation. And then I can think of this rapid little thing as just a little line, a tether, that connects one link component to another. And then it's an exercise in visualization that um, I have never managed to do successfully in full three dimensions, but you can do in a sort of a cheating fashion if you collapse things down to a 2D version of this 3D picture and see what's going on to convince yourself that you can move this tether around appropriately to change the linking number plus one surface into a linking number minus one surface by a process that only does singular things in the actual defect lines itself, which we allow for. So something that has linking number plus one with, on the surface, but the surface has color on it, there is a deformation that will take it to one of these completely planar things with no color, but with linking number minus one. That's the identification you should think of. So if we go back to the experiment, it's nice because the experimentalists used exactly this technique that I've been trying to describe to you of measuring or plotting what this second angle that's rotating is and plotting it exactly as some kind of color function on their experimental data. So you can read off fairly directly from the images that they provide you with what the surface is, and what the color winding on that surface is. And then it's just a process of deforming it to see after the deformation, when you make it a planar con configuration, is it linking number plus one or linking number minus one? And it turns out in this particular experiment, they made the one with linking number plus one. So that's at least uh, success in one case. Um, of course, uh, applying it as a general thing to identify completely arbitrary states for completely arbitrary knots is still something that's a long way off. But in some cases, uh, we can really work these things out. So a second feature or property um, of these knotted continuous fields that I'll show for you is that uh, they really depend on the entire knotted structure around them and not just on the lines that you see, not just on the link itself. It really matters that it's in a field. Uh, 
And this is a, an illustration of this. So I show you something where if I only show you the lines themselves, these look identical as identical hop flinks. But if I let this system evolve under relaxation of the energy for the liquid crystal, this costs a lot of energy because it has high distortion. And so it will try to reduce the amount of distortion in it. And there are reconnection events that happen. And you can watch what they look like for the liquid crystal under pure relaxational dynamics. So here's a little movie that's showing you what it's like in these two cases. And of course, the point is that I'm not showing you the same movie twice. Something different happens in the two cases. So the dynamics is different in the two cases. And it's different for a reason, although they looked the same at the outset when you just looked at the lines. You have to remember this is in some continuous field. And the structure of the field that's around these lines is important. And it was different in a topological way in the two cases. So you can go back and look at this. And the movie on the left was a planar configuration with this surface associated to it. And you can check that as linking number plus one. And the one on the right was, again, a planar configuration with this surface associated to it. So it was the other topological type with linking number minus one. And their dynamics is sense it really cares about this difference. So I'll maybe try to say very quickly, before I completely run out of time, um, about one extra little thing that we find that's uh, an interesting topological aspect of the behavior of, of knots and links in liquid crystalline materials. And that concerns when it's possible to squeeze everything down so that the liquid crystal lies in this xy plane and has no component that's pointing towards you. For this hot flink example, I could always do this. Any texture whatsoever, it was possible to push it around, continuously deform it, and turn it into something that was lying planar everywhere. But the question is whether or not you can do that in general. And it's not such a uh, crazy thing to think about in the liquid crystal context. This is something that, at least in principle, you could promote in an experiment by applying a magnetic or an electric field that likes to align the molecules. And in particular, if it likes to align them perpendicular to the field direction, then if I apply the field pointing straight towards you, they will try as best as possible to lie everywhere in this plane. With a few little blips, if you like. So there are four different types of blips. And now I have these little, these little localized regions where it's pointing towards you. And the question is, can I move those around and recombine them with each other and get rid of them? Yes or no? And so there's an answer to this. There's an answer to this again in terms of the topology and the topological classification. It turns out that you can do this if and only if the texture corresponds to an element in the order two subgroup of this homology group. So there's some, again, obstruction theoretic calculation that tells you that this is true. And what it says, for instance, is if I look back at these examples, then there are ex an infinite number of states on the, associated with the 4-4 torus link, but there are precisely two of them that you can realize in these planar configurations, and only two. And if I look at this collection of a trefoil knot, an unknot, and an unlink, then again, they're in an infinite number of states, but there are only two of them that you can realize in this planar configuration. And if I look at these Borromean rings, there are 16 of them, and there are four of them that you can realize in some kind of planar configuration. Um, so I think I'll stop here. I think uh, I'll go to my conclusion slide. But perhaps the last thing that I'll say is that this is still a mystery to me. We have an understanding of uh, what these planar configurations are for the hot flink. That was a linking number story that I told you about. It's fairly self-evident. As Renzo said, it was known even to Maxwell. Of course, Maxwell was a genius. Of course, it was known to Maxwell. That that there are no linking numbers, pairwise linking numbers, for these Borman rings. So what's the analogous way of thinking about the four distinct planar configurations that are associated 
with pneumatics with Borman ring defects, and I don't know that yet. Okay, so with that, I'll stop. I'll bring up my thanks slide. Maybe I'll flick through. I was going to tell you about cholesterics. Okay, thank you very much.